Dear Heavenly Father, hallowed be thy name. We thank you, Lord God, for the opportunity of this day. We thank you for the blessings that you have bestowed upon each and every one of us, Father. It is a great blessing to be a part of your family. And I pray, dear Lord, for, for all those unspoken prayers before you at this time. You know every heart, every dream, every wish, every concern. And we thank you for not only hearing these prayers, but we thank you for answering them in perfect season. And also we have these prayers before you at this time, Father. We pray for Heather, Isaiah, Becca, Jody, Olivia, Mr. Tally, Janet, and June. And all these, Father, we ask that you lead, that you guide, that you direct, that you touch. In Yeshua's precious holy name, we also ask for a divine healing, Father. In Yeshua's precious holy name, we pray. And as always, Father, we pray for all those who have come and gone from our chapel that you watch over them. We pray, dear Lord, that they have not forsaken thy word and that they will return to the sheepfold soon. And we pray, dear Lord, for Israel and for our nation, for thy kingdom to come, knowing that it will be thy will that will be done on this earth as it is in heaven, to which we say, Come, Lord, come, for we are waiting. And we are strong in our waiting, Father, by thy divine hand. And we pray, dear Lord, for those first responders every day they are on the front lines doing your work. For, for whomsoever will, Father, it makes no difference to them who they work on or who they help. And we pray, dear Lord, for our military who are in arms way or who are about to go in arms way for their safety and speedy return home. And as always, Father, we pray for the lost, those that do not have an opportunity this day to receive thy truth. Now, Father, I pray that you open up our eyes, that we may see, our ears, that we may hear thy words, as it is written, as it will be you that speaks to us this day. In Yeshua's precious holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. Okay, we're getting back in our Father's word. We will pick up where we left off uh, in the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 17. Now, where verse 16 had just told us, it's simply the Shekinah glory over the Lord Jesus Christ with the seventh trump sounded on what's called the Lord's Day. And he has returned at this point. And he's teaching. Now understand, this is a vision given to John in 95-96 A.D. But never, never forget the Word of God and the day you're taken to so that you can better understand what he's about to say and what he will request those to do. Now, God's elect is mentioned here briefly. Uh, will also have that double-edged sword. Because to understand what that means, God's truth will cut. When God's truth comes out, it cuts both ways. Some, it will offend people. Others, it will bless them by what they're willing to accept from the Word of God. Because that is the two-edged sword. It's the Word that comes forth. And it is, and, uh, and again, as we learn from verse 1, it is only a servant that will understand this book. If you are not serving the Lord Jesus Christ, you will not understand the book of Revelation. And uh, simple as that. But if you do wish to serve him, that means to, to plant seeds and be alert, whereby you can even serve him in the kingdom of God. Uh, then this word will fall in place and be revealed to you. If you're not serving him, forget it. You know, these aren't my words. These are his words. You know, and um, For you will be a child of the living God. So, we have been covering, covering a little symbology. Two-edged sword, the, the seven golden candlesticks, and... Uh, and we're going to bring it all together of, of what, what that means. With that said, let's ask wisdom of our Heavenly Father in the reading of His Word. Revelation chapter 1, verse 17, with wisdom, and it reads, 
And when I saw him, this being, of course, John seeing Christ, I fell at, at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am that I am, meaning in the ancient language, Ia Asha, Ia, that's in Hebrew. And uh, he's basically proclaiming who and what he is. Verse 18. He said, well, wait a minute now. I am that I am is God. Well, who is Jesus? See. Verse 18. I am that, that liveth and was dead, proclaiming who, who he is. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. Meaning that's that and have the keys of hell and of death. This is to say, he is the one who, who paid the price, and he's got the keys whereby you can bypass all that delusion. Now, one of the best ways you can end up in hell is to listen to some revolving rev that would tell you, well, you don't have to understand the book of Revelation. You're going to be gone. Because then you'll, you'll, you'll never have a key to get out of hell with. That's the key of David, the key of understanding, of wisdom. He, Jesus is the one that's got the key. He's got the knowledge. He's got the wisdom. And he's going to give you that knowledge and that wisdom that is going to unlock those uh, mysteries that were given in the book of Revelation and the entire word. As it's written in another place, the truth, which is the word, sets you free. So, that's why the key of David opens doors that no man can shut. Verse 19. Write the things, Christ telling John, write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. Oh, now what does that mean? Well, he wants John to write down everything that he sees. Not only what has happened to his, his past, but what's happening to his present, where he's in the Lord's day, also of future events that he's going to be shown in the kingdom of God. And he's on the Lord's day. In other words, you tell him the way it is right now. And you write those things down. Now, I want, I want to show you how kind our Father is here because this next verse is where really a five-year-old child can understand the entire first chapter. Verse 20. The mystery. That means the hidden truths. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand that we covered last week. And the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Now what are angels? Messengers. Messengers. Messengers to who? To mankind. To, well, ultimately that, to mankind, but it's to the seven churches. And the seven candlesticks, which thou sawest, are the seven churches. Now, is that difficult to understand? It shouldn't be. You're going to have messengers coming to the churches. And those churches are remembered to cover what we covered last week. What are those seven churches in representation of? All the churches. All the churches of the world because they're in a circle. You know, yes, they're in Asia Minor. But the fact is that was a representation of all the churches of the world. So Christ is telling John that all the symbolism is these seven messengers coming to these seven churches and to give them knowledge and wisdom of, of who and what they are. Now, a child can understand this. They open up their eyes to see and ears to hear. Now, why would some nut tell you that the book of Revelation was not to be understood? You no, know, because that's basically how it's coming out. Because you say, well, why are you calling them nuts? Because they are nuts when they're 
basically telling you the book of Revelation isn't to be understood. And if the book of Revelation is not to be understood, they're saying all that God has given us, they know more than God. Where God says, look, I want you to understand this. That's what the book of Revelation means. It means to be revealed. To have these words uncovered for us, for our understanding. But again, as chapter 1 says, chapter 1 says that you have to... Um, you have to be a servant of the living God to understand this. If you don't serve him, you're not going to understand this book. I don't care what kind of teacher comes to you. You're not going to be able to understand this book if you do not serve him. That's a, that's a stipulation. So you see, symbology simplifies God's word. Don't let it frighten anybody. It's God's way of teaching as if we were little children. And quite frankly... We are little children of the living God. Alright. Verse 20. I did verse 20. I did verse 20. Alright. Let me say one last thing. If you are following a so-called man or woman of God, that their voice is not of that same voice, which is the Word itself, you're going to be in trouble. You're going to be in false doctrine, false teaching. When they say you don't need to be here, the church won't be here, and, that, and you believe that stuff, you're going to be under, you're going to be falling into deception. Simple as that. And your life will be I won't say meaningless, but you will have a hard course to follow. And these seven stars are simply the seven angels he's getting ready in this next chapter, chapter two, to send out to those churches. So you'll know which one, which church, remember what I said the first three chapters are, it's, it's to teach you what church to be in, and it also teaches you whether or not the teacher you're hearing from is a proper teacher. Because if it's not following along the lines of what Christ gives us, you're in false doctrine. You're in false teaching. Simple as that. So, chapter 2. Verse 1, let's get into the into the churches. Let me get a sip here. Chapter 2, verse 1, and it reads, Unto the angel, unto the messenger, of the church of Ephesus, write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand. That's, remember, the seven angels who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. That's the seven churches. Never let symbo symbology stir you. You know, you now know his mystery here. The word Ephesus means permitted. Verse 2. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them or tolerate them which are evil and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles in other words not the apostles but those that claim to be apostles and are not and hast found them liars in other words you are one of those churches that that really stand up with with um, those that say don't do this and don't do that and, and you really you check them out. You make them validate who and what they are. So in other words, this is this is a good work here. They're doing good. Remember, we're going to find good works in all these churches. But we're only going to find two churches that Christ will find no fault with. Verse 3. And, still speaking of the, of the church of emphasis, and hast born, hast born means they have new converts, new people joining the church, and hast born and hast patience, that means persistence, and for my name's sake hast labored and hast not fainted. In other words, you really work hard at it, in my name, and you don't seem to fall short. 
Sounds pretty good, don't it? You, you plug at it pretty good. Hey, so far so good. Verse 4. Nevertheless, uh-oh, there's a problem. <laughs> In other words, because of all this, you've got, you got trouble right here. This, this means he has a fault with this church. And you need to pay close attention to the fault of this church. Because prior to this, it's all good works. He's, he's happy with what they're doing. But, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Now, what does that mean? Well, to a Christian, just let's, let's think this through. To a Christian, what is supposed to be our first love? love God. who is Christ mm -hmm. I supposed to now, now, now think this through just a moment this church is doing good works they're helping people they're bringing new converts into the church they're, they're, they're patient with them but Christ is saying they left their first love now how can you have a church that are doing these good works leave our Father. How do you leave your Father today? What do you think would cause a church now? Let's keep this in perspective. To keep a church, how would that church leave God? Not By doing what? Not teaching God's Word. Ah. Because this is His Word. And by not teaching his word chapter by chapter and verse by verse. Why is that important? We harp on it all the time. But why is it important to teach God's word chapter by chapter and verse by verse, line by line, so that we won't get off course? So that, so that we will stay focused on the subject, on the object, and on the article in which God gives us. We won't fall for doctrines of men. Or fall for doctrines of men. We, or traditions of men. Now why why is that critical to follow God's word that way? It's because if you are not following God's word chapter by chapter and verse by verse, you do other churches utilize God's word? Well, every church I've ever gone into uses God's word. But how much? You might get a verse or two and a bunch of their own terminologies and theologies and what that means. And they'll go from one book to... I mean, how many churches have you all been in? Or you've gone from one book to a different book to a different book to a different book. What they're saying is the same subject. No, whether it be healing, whether it be blessings, whether it be uh, salvation, you know, whatever the case may be, and they're jumping all over. You're constantly changing if you're even using the book. And sometimes they'll just put it up on a big screen now or pass out what Murray says, these rag sheets, these pieces of paper, and want you to read off the pieces of paper. Why doesn't our Father want us to learn that way? Why do you think he doesn't want us to learn that way? Because you miss what's being taught, and it can be tweaked. You can take a verse and make it say something completely different than... Make, make the subject say whatever man is saying it yeah. is instead of what God is saying yeah. it is. Because if you, if you write down all the places that you jump around, write down the verse and the book, and then afterwards go back and read the chapter, read the subject and the object... And the article of that verse, you're going to find out, nine times out of ten, it doesn't mean what they're talking about. It's a completely different subject. Now that is leaving your first love. That's where a church can leave God. And a church without God isn't a true church. See, see, Father, he, he gave us, He gave us all the good things that this church was doing. And they were doing good works. But, hey, 
they're, they're bringing new converts in, which is a wonderful thing, but what are they teaching them? Flyaway doctrine? That's how you can have a church teach flyaway doctrine, which isn't biblical. But they make it biblical be because of the way they teach it. They make it sound biblical, but it's not biblical at all. And I know, see, that's a two-edged sword. That cutting right now, to some people, it hurts them to hear that. But it's truth. They can deny it all they want to, but it can be proven in our Father's Word. How? By Ezekiel 13.20, by 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, very easily. But they only got one verse that they use in 1 Thessalonians. Meeting the Lord in the air. But they don't understand that air means breath of life. Taking it back to his prime root word. So, do you realize during the original gatherings and teachings that this is what was done really on Passover? The reading of our Father's word. Because in the on the original Pas Passover, they stood, we'll say, I won't say at attention, but they all stood there and uh, man, woman, and child until the entire word of God was spoken to them. The entire word on Passover. How far have we gotten away from that? Mm. Now, of course, they didn't have the New Testament then. They had the Torah. But the Torah would be read out loud every Passover. And everyone would hear the word of God. Now, we're most fortunate. See, back then, a lot of people, they didn't know how to read. Only the high muckety ducks and the, and the, and the kings and queens and the, and the priests would be able to read it. But that's why God provided a way for them to hear the Word of God because it was given to them at least once every year. And of course, they went on the synagogues and that, but I'm talking about the entire Word was read to them at that point. So you've gotten, people have gotten so busy with all these other things, they've left out the Word of God. That's what he's telling this church. Let me tell you something, a church that that does not teach God's word chapter by chapter and verse by verse God is not pleased with period verse 5 remember therefore from whence thou art fallen notice that word fallen and repent and do the first works or else now what does that mean? Go back to studying the Word of God, chapter by chapter and verse by verse, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will, here it is, remove thy candlestick out of his place except thou repent. That means, as far as I'm concerned, you cease being a church. You're not teaching. So as Christ would say, if you be in that case, you better repent. Because if you don't, the knowledge that you once was able to possess, you're not going to have anymore. The Word will not be with you anymore. Now think about that in some churches today. I'm not asking you to judge. That's our Father's uh, avenue to do. But how many churches have you been in that do not teach our Father's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse. Now they may be doing a lot of things for the community. They may be feeding the poor and, and housing the poor and, and helping the community and doing all these things. But if you leave God's Word, you've left God. And our Father is saying, because you've left me, I'm leaving you. And some people say, oh, he wouldn't do that. He just said he's going to. That messenger, the one that was giving them the truth, basically what we would call today the Holy Spirit within the church, is going to be removed. But in verse 6 it says, But this thou hast, you have this, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicola, uh Laetans, which I also hate. In, in other words, there's not much history really about the Nicolaitans, but 
it was a form of Baal worship. And I want you to note here about deeds or works. A church that has no works is dead. A church that has no works is dead. Now we used in this church. Let's let's bring it to let's bring it to ourselves. Let's let's lay out what we're doing or not doing today. We used to. I, I remember this time of year. What were we doing? Well, it's really after a couple of weeks ago. What did we do every year for a while? The Build parade. what? Huh? The parade float. Build a parade float. Well, it wasn't really the float itself. It was what we were doing from the yeah. float. Remember all those teddy bears and stuff? Those stuffed animals we'd, we would go out and, and get and, and hand them out to the children. You know. Uh, prior to that, what were we doing before we did the float thing? Oh, we're going to the hospital and the nursing home. Going to hospitals and nursing homes and singing carols. Singing carols, giving out fruit baskets here and there. Um, remember having the um, um, what was that called? From our hearts to your homes uh, mm -hmm. benefit. benefit. You know where everybody uh, worked hard going out and getting uh, things donated, and we had some really good things donated. Now, would you say those were all good works? Mm -hmm. Because they were they weren't for ourselves. We weren't trying to build up a church fund. Uh, we were trying to help other people. And the monies that we took in from that benefit we used for elderly fuel assistance. Didn't last very long because fuel assistance is very expensive. But every dime went for that. And still to this day uh, when we're able we give to the poor around this time of year. Now we're not doing all that stuff still. Does that mean we have no good works anymore? No. What is the good works that we have today? Anything that you do for someone else without any benefit to yourself. I know what it is, but I'm asking you, what does this church do to be considered a good work? Teaching. Number one, God. have we left our first love? No. How can you document that? Because we teach the word chapter by chapter and verse by verse. All right. Are we doing anything else? Each individual probably is. I mean, I'm talking about the church in general. Oh, the church in general. Well, let me ask you a different question. Do you need to do anything else? Do we need to go out and feed the poor continuously? I say yes. But how are we feeding the With poor? With the word. Well, see, the point is a lot of things... Everything that we're doing from the Word is being accepted as a good work. Going out on the airwaves is a good work. Having it available to anyone. Now, again, I guess you've got to have a computer or a, what do they call Wi-Fi to hook mm -hmm. to the computer or whatever to get it. I mean, we can get it on television now, you know, through YouTube. So we're still doing good works is the is the thing is just because we're not building floats now doesn't mean that we stop doing good works. Well that was the thing that was hard for me to understand for a long time was you know where it says in the word about clothing the naked and feeding the hungry and and giving drink to the poor or to, to the thirsty. I used to think that meant physically with those actual things but it all encompasses the word of God. It does. The clothing, because the food, what and the drink. Well see this is what our father is telling us here. This church did some good works and we're going to see other churches where they've gone out in the community to do all these things mm -hmm. but if you leave your first love you're not a church see so the important thing is to understand your first job if you will is to love the Lord with all your heart mind strength and soul which means you obey God's word and you do it and you teach that word so people can be fed, so people can be watered. That's what it's all about. That doesn't thing. mean that you can't help other people. <laughs> but here's taking it a step further. We are each individually the church. Yes. When we go out from here 
going Abs on individual ways. Ambassadors, if you will. Mm -hmm. So anytime we use the Word of God to encourage or uplift or um, not chastise exactly, but I can't remember the word. I always forget the word. But anytime we use the Word of God in helping someone else, whether that's a family member or a neighbor or a co-worker or even a stranger, we are being the church. Absolutely. And those are all good works. But why is work so important? Because a lot of people won't even teach about works. Because, because good works for the Lord is the only thing that you can take right. with you to the kingdom of God. The only thing. Because it's all written down. It's the only thing that you can take with you. And that pleases God. That is your righteous acts. You know, make up being the very garments you wear in heaven. And we'll document that when we get to it in, in this book of Revelation. So, one more verse. Verse 7. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Again, what are those spirits? The seven spirits are those those seven messengers that go to each church. Now they're basically maybe we need to pin down a messenger a little bit more. What what when when God says he sa sends those messengers to the churches or he says angels, what are they doing to the churches? What what are they bringing? Well, if they're a messenger, what is a mess? I, I know I'm breaking this down into finite terms, but people need to understand this. What does a messenger bring? A messenger from God bring to the church. What would a messenger bring to you in this church right now? What is that messenger bringing to us? They could bring wisdom. Um, they could bring... Uh, Enlightenment from word, word ah, of there's God. There's the key. Mm -hmm. A messenger brings you information. All right? I mean, let's let's get break it down. Mm -hmm. When you get a messenger comes up to you, what are they bringing? They're bringing you a message. Now, that message is something to give you information. All right? So. They need to bring, that messenger of God is bringing you information of who? God. His word. So he's bringing you information so that you may understand something. Now, if that messenger is pulled away, you can no longer receive the understanding. You got the same book. You got the same understanding. But the thing is, you can no longer understand what the book is saying. A messenger would also be something like what we might call an interpreter. Mm -hmm. That messenger comes forth, will interpret for you what you just read. Would that uh, also encompass the Holy Spirit? Of course it would. Because how can the messenger come to you without the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is the vessel that is used to enlighten you with. And without the Holy Spirit, you can't have enlightenment. So, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life. Now, what is that? Who is the tree of life? Christ. So it says here, To him that overcometh will I give to eat. What does it mean to eat? Well, if the tree of life is Christ and you're eating of that fruit, what are you receiving? Everlasting life. Or the word. The no. understanding of the word. See, it's critical. So without this messenger coming to the church, or churches, 
you're not going to be able to receive the knowledge of Christ, the knowledge of our Father, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And the paradise of God, of course, is simply meeting the garden of God. The fulfillment of this will come in chapter 22, verse 14 and 15 to be precise. When the grand reward is when you'll be able to partake of that tree of life. Literally. But don't be one of those that followed and partook of the tree of good and evil. Because we know that's also in the garden of God. And we know who that was. You wait for the tree of life, which is the true Christ. Now, it says here, have an ear to hear. Do you have an ear to hear? Not everyone does. Not everyone cares to. This is why in planting seeds, if an ear is closed when you're planting seeds, don't worry about it. Plant the seed and continue on. And then go to fertile soil. That means someone who's willing to listen. Don't don't worry about don't worry about it. Plant the seed and continue on. Don't cast your pearls before swine. Now that sounds harsh, but it's true. There's too many people out there that want to receive the truth. And they're not receiving it. But my personal opinion, and this is my opinion, if a person truly wants to receive the truth, they are going to find it. Because our Father wants them to receive it. But it just depends on their own heart. Whether or not they're willing to accept that truth. Right. And and again, don't plant your pearls before swine. Take the best. That's those that care about our Father and His Word or churches that believe in pleasing God, not man. Now, this time of year, we got all kinds of uh, activities going on and for different reasons. But... Um, some people want to follow a certain tradition. And we've learned over the years what our Father feels about that. And, and, and whether or not Christ did certain things or didn't do certain things. But it, this is really a good time of year that you can do a lot of good witnessing. Why? Because... To speak of God, to speak of Christ, really is taken in a lot easier this time of year. Because after all, that's supposedly what the season's all about. And I, I pick my words accordingly, supposedly what it's all about. Now, lately I've been witnessing to, I guess we got over about 20 people who I work with, and um, I've been able to, to make a declaration about uh, this season to just about all of them, not all of them at this point, although today might be an eye-opener for some. <laughs> but um, I came to a, a point in our Father's Word that Father gave me, and it's found in James chapter 4, verse 4. And it states this. It says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, men and women, know ye not that the friendship of the world... What does that mean, friendship of the world? Those that are following the traditions of the world. That the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. And that just went, that went through my heart like a knife. That, that, to me, that put it all in perspective. That when you are trying to walk in the ways of the world and the way they believe, what they believe in, you're an enemy of God. That's why I think when you witness of truth, and you know that truth, 
it is vitally important to know what you're doing. Because God gave you that truth for a reason. He's giving us these truths for a reason. He doesn't hate his children. He doesn't hate what, what some of the uh, churches are doing. But what he can't stand is when a church or a people's turn from that understanding once they learn it. So it's very critical for us to realize that he's giving us information and if we do not follow it, he's going to remove his candlestick. Meaning, he's going to remove our understanding of the simplest of things where a child can understand it. Because, why can a child understand it? Because we're a child of the living God. And we want to follow Him and His ways. And when we, we learn something that we may have been doing, that we shouldn't have been doing, nip it in the bud and repent and follow Him. That's all He's ever wanted. Well, I think it needs to be said, though, that when you do and have been following traditions for most of your life, it's very difficult to change. Yeah. It took us years. Years, absolutely. Always, it took us division, yes. even within the family, it, it, to we, change. We rationalized. Well, I'm doing this. I'm, I'm not. It, it doesn't mean this. It means this to me. And we did that for a number of years. So you have to be understanding when you're dealing with people who are still... What did he dealing. show us here? Patience. Patience, right. He just showed us in this church, to have, to this church, this church right here, had patience. But it still needs to be said that this is not, um, what's the word, uh, when you uh, can lose your salvation. You have the ability to repent at any time mm -hmm. of your actions. Mm -hmm. So you don't lose your salvation because of that. It's no, not, no, not a no. salvation issue. That's what it was. Yeah. Uh, no, this, this isn't a salvation issue. However, when James 4.4 4 says, let me read the whole thing. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. So the more you walk in the world. See, people are walking in the world. What that means, people are walking in the world and say that they're following God. Right. But any time anyone turns from God or sins, that's enmity with God. Of course it is. But you Wages have, of sin is death. But you have repentance. Yes, but once wages of sin death. is death, and once you mm -hmm. once you stay in sin, that's the key. You stay in sin, knowing knowing that it's not of God. Well, that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about people who choose to follow <laughs> the ways of the world instead of the ways of God, and they know better. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. And and when they do that, granted, that's between them and God. The thing is, if they're walking in the ways of the world, that's the wages of sin. Because the enmity, it says very clearly, the world is the enemy of God. If you're walking in the world, you are of the enemy of God. So let me ask you this. Um, this time of year, we believe to be the conception of Christ. Well, it is. Right. So, how you celebrate that. can be what? It can be like full out with the, like Murray says about decorating the tree and, and all that. Yeah, Maybe you don't or, worship the tree or right. anything like that. Yeah. There's absolutely not, in my opinion, I don't see anything wrong with it. If that's what you choose to do. I don't see anything wrong with it. But the thing is, you you honor the Lord for the right reason. Yeah. You know, in other words, you're not, you're not, you're not baking him a birthday cake. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. We'll just leave it at that. Cakes. Yeah. We'll just, we'll leave it at that. And, and the thing is, but you, you're not, you're not putting a certain other uh, 
mystical character as the main forefront. You're putting God first. Christ first. That's what it's all about. But, see, putting a mystical character in the forefront is doing of the world. Tradition. Because those are traditions of men. And that's where you can fall short. Now, which we'll get into after the camera's off. But what our Father wants us to understand, and it's very clear, next week we'll, we'll hear of the church that God finds no fault with, which is very important. But uh, we'll end here today in, in, in this teaching. But we've, we've got to understand that Father will find fault with every church except for two. So we need to know what the good works are, but we really need to key on what he finds as a bad work. And what's important, two churches that he finds no fault with, what are they doing? Because in my personal opinion, that's the church we want to be a part of. Well, I think the two basic ideas are to keep your focus on what you're making important in your life and where your desire lies. Well, I would say keeping him focused in your life well, yeah, and everything. Course. I'm saying to keep, yeah, exactly. Yeah, because if you keep him focused, how can you go wrong? All right, are there any questions? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word today. We thank you for your blessing. We thank you for your teachings. We thank you for your mysteries made clear to us, Father, with clear understanding where a child, your child, can understand fully. And we pray for everyone here today and those on YouTube that, that you watch over them, lead them, guide them, and direct them, and forevermore we will give you all glory, honor, and praise. For we do love you with all our hearts, with all our minds, with all our strengths, with all our souls. For it is in Yahshua's precious holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. To God be the glory.